On today's Retro Tech Repair, we're going to be investigating some sound problems with our Color Computer 2 and using discrete components to do a homebrew mod to the RF modulator, giving us a composite video out. Hello, and welcome to Retro Tech Repair. We've got a lot to get through today with repairs and mods to our Color Computer 2. Composite mods are quite hard to do on this computer and the majority of those that I've seen require you to replace the modulator with a custom board. But we're going to be taking a different approach using only discrete components to modify the existing modulator and I'm going to share with you a great resource that I found online for the TRS-80 color. We'll also be doing a quick and easy RAM upgrade and we're going to take a look at some games. This is the second part of a two part series. In the first part, I took a look at a problem with the keyboard, which turned out not to be a problem with the keyboard at all, but a problem elsewhere in the computer. And when I got that working, discovered there was no sound. If you haven't seen that video, please check it out. But for now, let's get on with this one. So here's our TRS-80 color without sound. And what's interesting about it is if I type in a sound command, you can see that it stops to execute the command, but there's no sound coming out, and you can see that the volume is turned, you know, to a good level. So there is no sound coming out, but if I connect the oscilloscope up to the modulator where the sound goes in, you can see that when you type a sound command, then you get a sound wave on the oscilloscope although there's still no sound coming out of the television. In fact, you can probably hear the buzzing. So obviously the problem is within this modulator. So at this point I should really mention something and it comes from a comment on the first part of this two-part series. The footage that we're watching now was recorded before the first video went out and as Wenlock TV DX pointed out, the sound carriers for NTSC and PAL are at different frequencies. So once I repaired the keyboard and got everything else working, it's possible there actually wasn't anything wrong with this computer at all and it was just that my television wouldn't correctly tune to the signal from it. Wenlock TV DX goes on to explain some of the advantages of the NTSC versions of these computers versus the PAL equivalents, such as the use of horizontal blurring and artifact colors to generate additional colors outside of the video chip's color palette. This can create better looking games than their equivalents on a PAL-based platform, such as a TRS-80 Color Computer 2 from the UK or a Dragon 32, both of which use an identical video chip to that used on the NTSC version. Given this new information from Wenlock, it's possible that actually there wasn't anything wrong with the modulator, but as we will see, there will be soon. For now though, let me introduce you to that great resource that I found for TRS-80 color computers, who I'm sure wouldn't have made the rookie mistakes that I did. So there is no information on this modulator in the service manual, and because it's a custom part, I think, a custom part for Radio Shack, there's no information about it really online. There's no data sheets from the manufacturer or anything like that. This is just shown as a black box on the circuit diagram, just as if it was another IC, but you can't get a data sheet for it. However, there's been some great work on YouTube by a guy called AC from AC's 8-Bit Zone. Hi, this is AC's 8-Bit Zone. And he's done some fabulous work on the TRS-80 and particularly on this modulator and getting composite mods and all sorts of stuff. If you haven't checked out his channel and you're interested in the TRS-80 color and a lot of other 8-bit stuff, check it out because he really has some interesting stuff on there. But one thing that he did point out was that the audio is modulated onto the RF carrier via one transistor. That's this Q1 in here. So I'm going to try and take that out and test it. And so here is our suspect part. The part number, at least that it's marked with, is a C1674, and there's a number underneath L28C. I'm not quite sure what that means, but uh, we'll pop in the transistor tester and see how it tests out. And it tested out to be a perfectly functioning transistor. So at this point, I decided that some off-camera pot twiddling was required, or more accurately, off-camera transformer twiddling. I mistakenly refer to it as an inductor in the video. But either way, I broke it. This inductor was damaged by me. I cracked the ferrite core by over-tightening it, and so now I need to do something with that. 
So if we look at the superb circuit diagram that AC put together on his site for this modulator, the only thing that couples the output from the A to D converter, the sound output, to the RF out is this micro transformer here. So without a core, that is not going to be transferring any audio across at all. It's the only way the two are coupled. And so because of that, we need to try and find a replacement core for this. So I was looking around to see if I could find a ferrite slug to go into this, and I've happened across this old radio parts that I had. I'm not very good at repairing radios and radio cassettes and the like. So for that reason, I have quite a few boards like this, well, a couple at least. What surprised me was when I see these RF cans, I'd always kind of assumed that each of the slugs was the same size, but it's very much not the case. However, there is one here that looks like it might fit. So we're gonna take that out and, uh, and slide it into here. My fear is, of course, it's just going to slide up and down because there's no threads on this, but we'll take a look and see if that's the case. So here it is, as you can see, it's pretty small. And uh, I now need to get that, in fact, already cracked itself. Oh no, maybe it's not, I think it's just made that way. I, I need to get that now into this RF can and we'll see if it slides around when it's in. And yet, you know, it does. It's just sliding straight in there with no degree of kind of adjustment in or out when it's turned, which isn't what we want. We want to be able to slide that in and out so we can increase and decrease the coupling between the two sides of the coil, which make the transformer. So I don't have a lot of good ideas. This probably isn't one of them either, but uh, I got some electrical tape. This is cheap electrical tape from the pound shop. What's nice about that is you get quite a lot of rolls of it for a pound, by the way, but because of that, it's quite thin. And I want something that's thin in order that I can kind of wrap this ferrite core a little bit and maybe get enough engagement in here to keep it in place. Although it's not going to be that adjustable. I might have to push it back and forth. So I've just done one kind of tiny little wrap of that and I've pulled it very tight so that the uh, thread appears through. And uh, we'll try cutting that off now and seeing if it will stay in the uh, in the RF cam. I think this is probably worth a go. We'll see if we can at least get some basic audio going and then we'll take it from there. And while we're at it, I think we'll solder in that transistor that we took out because I don't think that was the problem at all. I'm pretty sure it's this RF transformer now. But unfortunately, no amount of twiddling of my new transformer is restoring the sound. And in fact, I've lost the color from the RF image as well. So yeah, that was not a success. Oh boy, what a shame, because really I just need to replace this modulator. I'm never gonna find a spare for that, at least not in the UK. I could replace it with a composite mod, which I'd have to buy from the US, or I can try and modify it myself. So perhaps that's what I'm going to have to do. I certainly can't get this one to work. So it's AC's 8-bit zone to the rescue again, and I decide to remove the RF modulator and do the composite mod that AC has posted on his YouTube channel. This really isn't a simple modification, so I'm going to describe it as quickly as I can using the notes from AC's page. Now I know that some viewers watch this channel to help them relax, and I think that's quite flattering. And if that's the case, you might find the next two minutes especially relaxing if you look away. And if you're sensitive to flashing or fast-moving images, you probably should look away. If, however, excitement is your thing, then you're probably in the wrong place altogether, but you might also want to fast-forward through the next couple of minutes and get to the point where the modification is almost complete. Either way, you've been warned. Here goes. Remove C1, C3, C6 to C11, C13 to C19, D1, D2, L1 to L3, Q1, R1, R2, R5 to 17, T1 and T2. Remove L5 and move L4 to L5, jumper old L4 location. Add a red or white RCA connector in the old channel selector opening, needs drilling. Solder the new RCA shell to the metal case. Tie the RCA center pin to the junction of R12, R13 and R14. Add a 100 microfarad 16 volt bulk capacitor across C12. Change R8 to 680 ohms. Change R6 to 680 ohms. Change C20 
to 0.1 microfarads R14 to 3.9k ohms. Replace R13 location with a 22 nanofarad capacitor. Change R16 to 75 ohms. Replace L3 location with a 3.3k ohm C19 with a 470 ohm. Replace C17 location with a 2N4403 base and collector with collector next to C18. Replace C18 location with 2N4401 emitter and base with emitter next to R16. Tie 2N4403 emitter and 2N4401 collector to plus 5 volts. One tie point is at R4. Reuse old D1 or any 1N4148 across both D1 and C1 locations. The anode connects to U1 pin 14 and the cathode and band to U1 13. Add one wire that jumps across both C14 and C15 and connects 4403 base to U1 12. Add one wire that connects C14, C15 junction to 4401 emitter. Oh, you're still here. Fantastic. So the approach that I took was to carefully follow each of the instructions, marking off on the circuit diagram those things that I had addressed at the point when I addressed them. So I think now I only have the audio jack left to install, so we'll go ahead and do that. And these are the audio jacks that I'm going to use. I bought them a little while ago. I think, actually, I was going to use them on a Coleco mod, but uh, I didn't. So, uh, yeah, this was going to do the job nicely, I think. I'm just going to try and screw it in here, but I think it's just going to be a little tight, so I'm just going to make a little bit of a hole, or make that hole a bit wider using a file. And I can just screw this in here. Great. Like so. That's tightened up quite nicely, so I'm quite happy with that. Let's hope we can get the nut on the back too. Now the shell is going to be an adequate ground for us, so we only have one wire to solder in here. That's not too shabby. I might put a bit of solder on there maybe, see if I can get a, make sure I have a really good electrical connection, I'm not sure. Let's keep tightening it for now. Okay, I think that's going to be fine. I just need to get a wire from there to somewhere over here. And there we have it. Hopefully that is our modded modulator, which should give us composite video out and audio out. Oh, I'm a bit nervous. Let's put it in the machine and see what it does. So unfortunately the battery in my wireless microphone went flat when I was filming this segment, so it's up to VoiceOver me to tell you that I just put the covers on each side of the modulator and soldered it back onto the printer circuit board before reassembling everything and giving it a go. So here goes. Switch on the TV, make sure it's on AV, and it is. Power supply switched on, switch on the computer. Uh oh. So I've had a good look through our modulator here, and I've been through the circuits on the circuit diagram and marked everything off and I'm pretty sure I've done everything I was supposed to do. The only thing that was bothering me was the location of these two transistors. So I've taken those out. I'm going to check them in a circuit tester to make sure I've got the pins in the right orientation and I'm going to put them back in the board. Well, probably put new ones in, back in the board, hopefully this time the correct way around, hopefully not contacting anything they shouldn't be contacting and we'll try it one more time. And this is our 2N4403, and I've got one in the circuit tester here. Press the button, and it's going to confirm that it's a PNP transistor, which it should be, and it's going to show me which pin is in which socket. So we have the emitter in one, and then the base in two, and the collector in three. So I need to make sure when I put it in the board that it matches up with the emitter base collector locations 
on the printed circuit diagram that we have modded up here from AC's site. And I'm pretty sure that's different to before, so hopefully I got it correct this time. And we'll repeat that process now for the 2N4401, pop it in the circuit tester, see what pins are what. And it's confirmed as an NPN transistor with the emitter in pin 1 of this connector, base in pin 2 and collector in pin 3. So let's try this again now. Hopefully I can get this soldered back in. Let's see. Yes! <laughs> oh, fantastic. That's brilliant. Excellent. And it looks a lot sharper than it did on the, uh, on the VHF or UHF as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, uh, let's try the sound. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, so that is really, really good news. I am really, really, really happy with that. So it's not over for our Color Computer 2 just yet. We're going to start out with our 64K RAM upgrade, and the first thing that I'm going to do is remove each of these 16K RAM chips, they're 16K by one bit, and there's eight of them to give us eight bits, and replace them with 4164 64-bit ICs. And then I have a jumper to make, W1, which is just between U6 and U7, and after that, the machine should become a 64K Color Computer 2. Well, I can't really tell you how excited I am to be getting this back together now. I always feel a great sense of relief when I've got the final enclosure all kind of buttoned up, everything back where it should be. It just feels altogether safer for the machine rather than me having bits of it in what is quite a cramped space. And it wouldn't be the first time for me to spill a cup of coffee over something or step on it or it fall. So yeah, I'd be very excited to get this back together. So one thing that I need to do before I can put everything back together is to modify the case to accommodate the new RCA connector that I put in for the sound output. To do this I am widening and rounding the existing hole that was previously used for the RF channel selector switch. So I drill a hole in the plastic and then I finish it off with a file. And there we have it. Quite happy with that. It's not too intrusive, not much of a mod really, just there was already a hole there, just making the hole a little bit larger. So yeah, yeah, I'm quite happy with that. It about wraps it up for our Tandy Radio Shack Color Computer today. It's been with me about a year now and it's been quite a journey. From a tired, yellowed, non-functioning 16K machine to a working 64K model with a composite output. If you'd like to leave feedback on the video today, I always appreciate it. I read all of the comments and I respond to just as many as I can. But I do hope that you've enjoyed the video and that if you have, you'll consider hitting like and subscribe. And until next time, I'd just like to thank you so much for watching Retro Tech Repair. And off we come with a lid.